public, the parts that you were talking about earlier. This article was repelled by October 1967, so it, it just disappeared from, from the law book of the occupied territory. And since then, as most of us know, Israel repeatedly argued that the Geneva Convention does not formally apply. But what is important to notice is that the military legal advisors saw the convention as applying and planned the administration of an occupation territory accordingly. The military legal advisors have initially referred to the territories as occupied and <coughs> changed their terminology only after the war to administered territory, following the government's position but that change of terminology did not affect the way things were handled by them on the ground. In subsequent litigation in the Israeli Supreme Court, state attorneys did, did argue that the Geneva Convention does not formally apply, but they never denied the application of the Hague Convention, and accordingly the fact that the ter territories were under belligerent occupation uh, according to international law. The position that this is a belligerent occupation was gradually accepted by the Israeli Supreme Court, which acknowledged it in an unequivocal and explicit manner only in 1983, 20 years after the military attorney general saw it that way. However, beyond this remarkable foresight of the military legal advisor, advisory system, none of its mechanisms seem to have worked under the notion of temporariness, which uh, should have been part of the concept of occupation. On the contrary, the military bureaucracy have moved very quickly from a mode of emergency to regularity, preparing for the long term. Although they have devised a temporary paradigm to work within, their practice does not, did not reflect that notion, but rather it reflected a, do, a notion of an indefinite rule or control of these territories. The basic structure of the military advisors for the different regions was already anticipated, like I, I just articulated, and laid down in, within these strong boxes. But on June 30th, so the occupation was June 7th, and uh, on June 30th, the Minister of Defense, Diane, held a thorough discussion about the structure of the military government, introducing changes to the initial structure. An order that was published on the same day, June 13th, in the southern region of Gaza Strip and Sinai, is titled Permanent Orders for Military Government. So it was, it was considered as permanent by June 13th. On June 20th, only two weeks after the establishment of the military government, the initially planned structure again required adjustments. A letter from a senior officer in the military uh, attorney general office required the establishment of a special department that would deal with military government and issues and would coordinate between the legal advisors of the different regions. The letter argues that the experience acquired so far proves that the legal advisors and military courts could not be operated efficiently and with uniformity without a guiding hand. A few months later, in October, referring back to this letter um, and this phase in the military government, he described it as a transition of the military government to a permanent mode. Um, on July 4th, 1967, the Israeli par parliament enacted emergency regulations on legal assistance matters between Israel and the territories which were valid for three months. On August 31st, the military attorney general Shamgar proposed to extend these regulations, not by another three months, but by over more than a year until December 1968. So, and the proposal was adopted and these regulations are in force until today after multiple exceptions. So, emergency and temporariness actually lasted only a few weeks and was followed very quickly by a permanent mode of governance. These examples are only for the very few months of the occupation. Just like the military advocate general had the foresight to plan the occupation ahead, the whole system saw ahead and transitioned from emergency mode to a permanent mode within weeks. This is obviously only the beginning of a long history, but these very first moments are very telling. This was the bureaucratic or administrative vision of the future and in the case of Israel, it was much clearer than the political vision, uh, which created everlasting uncertainty and indeterminacy over the type of regime and the outlook of the future. 
However, if you look at the administration, there is a much greater degree of certainty and determination. The concept or the paradigm of occupation was thus not externally forced on Israel. In fact, it was planned internally ahead of time and willingly assumed it upon itself on the level of the administration, a strategy that continues to serve Israel very well until these days. So thank you um, for a fantastic panel. Apologies for being late this morning. Um, I wanted to just give a few remarks kind of connecting what I heard, but also commenting separately and, and maybe sparking a discussion. I don't have any questions in mind, maybe they'll crystallize as part of these comments. But I'll start with um, Madara's uh, conversation about the, the, the military regime and military governance as beginning as something that Israel imposes upon itself rather than it being an external imposition. Um, there's so much synergy between the conversation I've prepared for later this afternoon and what you've said today, so I, I really look forward to hearing what you have to say. But what, what, I, what I've been thinking about, not only did Israel internally impose it, it, it couldn't have achieved the current status quo without it. That strictly taking, annexing the land not only created conflicts for it because of international law and the prohibition on conquest by 1967, it had just become passé, but that even if they decided to annex, notwithstanding those pr prescriptions in international law, it would have had to absorb the Palestinian population, disrupting its demographic, Jewish demographic majority, which it didn't want. So what occupation law offers to Israel is a way around this. So it becomes fundamental to this incremental annexation that we're seeing in the present and is a matter of foresight. And in fact, this idea of you know temporary, so occupation is meant to be temporary, and yet here we have an indefinite structure, is exactly what Mayer Shemgar says himself. And it says plain faith. Indefiniteness, in, in, indefinite is not the same as permanent. Of course, I think it's only lawyers who <laughs> see that with a straight face and somehow make an argument that that's not permanency. Um, but so then, so then what happens is that what we may consider as, um, as, as systematic violations of occupation law in the form of settler colonial entrenchment in the territory, and we can, we may, especially as lawyers, you know, register that as the outlier and the aberration and something in Israel not being held to legal account is in fact a structure in and of itself that Israel's creation of exception, and it has created this exception in its own language, is the creation of exception, and this goes into this debate, is exception within the law or is exception actually outside of the law? I would think it's very much within the law because this exception is creating an alternative legal model. It's not arguing to abandon the model altogether. And Israel uses its concept of sui generis, uh, which is to say, you know, the Latin term in law that unto itself, which is very much unto itself, in order to make that argument. Okay. So, but what's what's interesting here is the continuity. Of, of these practices, and so that's um, very interesting to also hear, I think, both um, Joel and Lena discuss those continuities. So for um, Joel, as I was listening to you, something that was really interesting uh, was thinking about 242 and the elision of Palestinian peoplehood. So 242 is a failure. 242 is an absolute failure, um, and it seems like a concession that the Arab, Arab states actually um, uh, approved, but for the Palestinians it was clear from the beginning that this was giving um, the, the uh, de jure recognition, potential de jure recognition of Israel's permanency and presence without anything in exchange, and in fact reified the illusion of the establishment of Israel per 181, because that's where Israel draws its legitimacy from, without also extending that right to Palestinians in that moment. That elision in 242 actually drives 
Uh, what I would say that the PLO actually, I mean, led by Arafat and the moderate forces within the PLO, drove them to pursue a diplomatic course um, even before 1974. And in fact, what they do in the lead up to 1974 and the aftermath of the war, specifically because after the 73 war, I think it becomes clear that there will be no conventional war. That Egypt and Syria were not going to be willing to, to, to go to war with Israel in, in order to reverse the status quo. And so, uh, as part of the moderate forces, um, I think Arafat saw that diplomacy was going to be the way forward. But 242, because of this illusion, becomes an impediment. And in fact, what the PLO does, and part of it, I think, what its contribution remarkably to international law, in fact, because the PLO creates a model of non-state actors in the international legal system, which prefers that prioritizes and, and privileges states, is that they legislate within the General Assembly an alternative to 242 in the General Assembly Resolution of 3226 which creates an approach um, for Palestinians to engage in diplomacy without having to cross these three red lines that are created by 242, which is non-recognition, non-negotiation, um, and, and no peace. And so 3226 now becomes uh, an alternative to 242, and of course we see the PLO accept 242 in 1988 um, in ways that not only uh, are concessions, to 242, but are in fact become a regression. Because once Israel enters the peace process, even though it had said no negotiations with the PLO at all, but no negotiations without Pal with Palestinians without acknowledging 242, um, enter, into, uh, enter into these negotiations and now say, 242 will be whatever we agree on as a political matter. And so con this continuity of, of law not determining the outcome, but instead of this balance of power and violence um, determining that. And so um, I think that the, the other thing I wanted to say here, and Lena, I'd love to hear you um, to, to comment on this, and maybe I'm completely wrong on this, but not for what I understand is that the moment of, so the moment of 1960, we see as you know a moment of Israel extending its jurisdiction across the territories and over Palestinians. If as if as we do as, as Shirin say, a dear friend of mine um, encourages has encouraged us to do in her book, Men of Capital, encourages me to do as a colleague, is to think of Palestine outside of the shadow of, of colonialism, outside of these colonial shadows. And so for 67, for many Palestinians within Israel, this becomes a moment of reunification, as you mentioned, Lena. This becomes the end of isolation, and in fact, being able to establish some sort of continuity with the Arab world, and especially with Palestinians um, in the territory. But at the rise of the PLO, um, and, and, and when Palestinians take over the PLO, the armed groups take over the PLO, I think what's also happening within Israel is a non-recognition movement by Palestinian citizens of the state, who are not only just waging, uh, you know, insisting on becoming citizens and recognized, but are also insisting upon um, engaging in a, a form of non-recognition of Israel as an illegitimate presence, which is very much also a legal tactic, which is why I think of it. And I'm thinking of Nadi Balad and Hizb al Ard, who are who are leading this. I'm not sure, but I'd really be interested in hearing you say that. And then lastly, if we were to disaggregate these different communities. One of the communities I think that gets left out of the conversation, um, Joel Warnett uh, asked us to think about the religious elements of, of governance, but to think also about the Mizrahim and where they fit, so Middle Eastern Jewish Israelis and where they fit in this juncture in 1967. One thing to think about is that before 1967, they're very much a target of rehabilitation in order to recreate the, the Middle Eastern Jew into the new Jew and to make them fully Israeli by becoming and approximating a European whiteness. So what um, Ella Shahad encourages us to, you know, says is that being Israeli meant you, your history was one of the shtetl and the program, which might have nothing to do with Jews in Yemen and Morocco and Syria and otherwise. So how then does 1967 offer this population um, a moment of ascent? to become part of the system because now everything that's considered an outlier to their Israeliness, their Arab culture, Arab language, 
um, and understanding now becomes an asset in the military regime over the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, where now they become elevated as part of this military regime, create some sort of vested interest for this subsegment of the population um, to support the occupation. So those are just uh, some comments, not many questions. Thank you, wonderful, great. Before we open up, I want to give the panelists the chance to, to respond both to Nora and to each other's papers in case they have something to say in the middle of them. So we will start. Sure. So we're supposed to be all talking about the time here. And uh, joined the Histadroit. They weren't allowed to join the Histadroit until much later, but that was their way of thinking about things. But it became pretty clear very quickly that no, that wasn't going to happen. And Emil Tuma, who continued to argue for that, was eventually not allowed to be any longer a member of the Central Committee because it just, it just wasn't going to work. Um, and, and then um, in, in the West Bank, the legal system, so Stradaris is, is pointing out some really interesting things that I didn't know about planning for the occupation. But the other force that is planning for the occupation, and that in fact wants a war, is Army High Command. So they, both of those forces are, in a sense, living in a different time than the rest of the citizens of the state of Israel because they know that a war is coming. It's only a question of time. And so, of course, they have to have contingency plans to prepare for it. So for all of the citizens of Israel who are not privy to that information, for them, the war is a shock. And of course, even more so for Jews in the United States and around the world and, and others uh, as well. So how it's never quite been meshed as part of an explanation that there were elements, important, powerful elements, institutions in the state of Israel that understood this war is coming. And this is what we're going to do. And others go, whoa, the second Holocaust. And, and then just a question. What about the experience of military law in 1956 in the occupation of the Gaza Strip? That's what we got. Well, I actually have a paragraph. Um, I'll see. I have, actually have a paragraph about that. Just 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 because, well, because I thought I didn't have enough time. so. Uh, there's another um, important, uh, the first military governor of, or the head of cooperation with the government and the military in the occupied territories, Shlomo Gazik writes in his book that the occupation of 1967 was completely different from that of 1956. Because in 1956, it was obvious that we were not going to stay there. We were going to pull out very quickly. And in 1967, that was not the situation. So this is the stance on it. Um, thank you, Nora, and thank you, Joel, because you touched on, on, a, on a question that I'm actually right now just kind of very much uh, grappling with and, and torturing myself about it, of, of kind of, for me, political imagination is key in a way of thinking about this. It is that, that trying to understand what is it that makes people like the communists decide in either November or February, it's not fully accepted, uh, uh, to accept, or sorry, December or, or February, to accept the partition and, and move towards advocating for it. And then what is it that in July, because Nazareth is really central in the story, because in, when, when Nazareth is occupied, the communists basically really are the only leaders who are around in the Galilee, in that part of the Galilee, to kind of do anything, except for the mayor and in Israeli and others who were already collaborated with the Israeli Zionist institution from the 448. So those ones were, had already accepted the Zionist uh, narrative. The mayor and some of the religious and family-based leadership is trying to figure out where to fit and kind of playing on both sides. 
So you, we will cooperate, but we're going to kind of try to not look like we're cooperating too much. And this is the foot dragging resistance thing that I'm talking about. And then the communist, there's a point where it's clear that at least in all kept record, there's on the one hand this line that you're talking about, which is 181 still matters, the Arab state, etc. But on the other hand, we're going to also act as if this is a fait accompli. And we're going to try to then set the reality, the perimeters of this reality, um, in a way that will guarantee the most for us. Right, because I mean, at this point, there's also continuing expulsion, so they're still thinking about that. There, you know, even in fifty, when was Majdal? Fifty-one. In fifty-one, there's already a Majdal. A whole city basically is depopulated, and and the communists are still grappling with like what we literally have to be fighting for physical presence in our homeland. So there is this constant tension of what is it that makes these activist leaders understand their reality in a way that kind of gets them to, to try to juggle this reality in a way that kind of eventually comes up that is all in, in to a large extent, even when the discourse continues, because until basically 57, right, is, the last, is when they finally give up on 181 formal. But until that point, they're, they're playing the double game. Also, on the one hand, we're acting, we're going to make full claims of citizenship, and on the other hand, we're also still talking about the Arab city, which is in most of the areas that they're prominent in, which is the, the, the Galilee. Uh, but um, along with that, the, the political prospects are very limited, and that's a part of how I'm seeing it. There's no other political potential until 59, and then 59 is alive, and that goes on until uh, 64, 65, depending on you see the formal end of it. But the art, even an art, is not a non-collaboration, non-cooperation movement. Mm -hmm. Up until, actually, up until Na'ibala, I think, there was a complete playing within the system, but outside of the system, in a way, in this balance. Because the art, everything they do is literally going to the Israeli courts. They try to publish a newspaper, but every other activity they did was going to the Israeli court. They have developed the Israeli case law in a very, very significant way in that, because the two of those cases are actually major cases in the Israeli, um, in, in the Israeli case law, Kadosh, and, and, and then later, of course, the, the decision about the right of elections. So up until 67, I think, the need to find a place within, to, to, get, to find a place within a state in order to guarantee continued presence, physical presence, I think, is an important part of this question. Um, I'm not sure what else comes into that, right? Because a lot of is, I mean, they're lawyers. Like, most of them are lawyers. And they're very invested in that project. Abnet is odd, I think a part of that then is actually the post 67. That moment where the place within, the physical place within Israel for Palestinians becomes somewhat of a, a more safe place because of the exclusion or the double exclusion of Palestinians and the Ottoman I think that's where Abnet can be understood in a more, um, uh, I guess, logical for me, at least in grappling with these questions, uh, uh, way. Because up until that point, there was really very, very few people who said, no, we're not playing within the system at all. People, what's the, what's the name of the communist guy in Houston? Farah, uh, Farah, is one of the few who actually really kind of stepped out of the play. But for the most part, the others are just trying to figure out how do you negotiate the system. Uh, so you just really, I just enjoy very much your talks and learned about many things that in my legal scholarship I don't um, get into. I think that the way you portray Lina, the Palestinian citizens of Israel, their negotiation, their taking seriously their citizenship, is extremely important and it's now being discussed and I think you join Hassan Jabarin and others that are writing about this right now. So it's so it, it seems to be very, very um, relevant and extremely interesting and so starkly opposite to the, the whole conception of the military regime at, at that time that Israeli um, Palestinians were dangerous and had to be governed militarily and this all happens at the same time, but I think that gradually with, with works like this and with Shiva Robinson's work, 
it's, it's becoming obvious that the military regime had no security justification whatsoever, and it's only like a mode of governance that is enacted through the military as, as a tool of governance and not in any way relating to, to security threats or to protecting Jewish population in any, in any, um, in any sense. And it's, it's funny what you said about Al-Ab because um, so many Jewish Israeli legal scholars, when they want to write about Palestinian Israelis, they write about Al-Ab because this is what is in the law books. Okay, they got to the Supreme Court, they are in the law books, all the rest is just not, not there. So it's not researched and nobody writes about it. So. <laughs> Thank you everybody. Well, uh, we are ready to open it up to the audience, so um, you have the floor. Questions, comments, anything? Please. Well, I guess this brings us to the two-state solution. And uh, now I'm, I'm not an academic, so I'm just you know, a member of the citizenry. Uh, but all the mantra that we hear in this country when anybody <coughs> speaks and the, uh, from the government's on, it's always that this two state solution is the only solution. Uh, and I think uh, Netanyahu and Israel also gives lip service to it. I'm beginning to think it's a red herring that they use as a diversion to ever have to do it. So uh, I wonder if you have any comments about uh, the relevance of the two-state solution there. Would you like to take the <laughs> So I, I actually think it is a, a red herring, but not only from the point of view of the current Israeli government. Um, I don't think it's worth spending much effort talking about whether there's going to be one state or two states or should be one state or two states. Because for the foreseeable future, there aren't going to be any states. Um, what we should be focusing on now, I think, is what is actually happening to the Palestinian people in historic Palestine, uh, the various ways in which the Israeli regime is oppressing them, beating them down, trying to uh, coerce them into uh, accepting their circumstances, uh, strengthening the Palestinian people's ability to stay on the land, uh, supporting their uh, desire to make connections among the different parts of the Palestinian people, uh, talking about Palestine as an instance of separate colonialism. Uh, because talking about one or two states is divides us over something which isn't real. I mean, if, it, if tomorrow, that was on the agenda, okay, we can have that discussion. But it's not. I mean, I agree with you, Joel, that it is important to talk about all the points that Laura talked about. But one thing that I do want to highlight in the, in the talk about two-state solution is that there is also the question of sovereignty, which is a question that Palestinians advance, that I think we can, as in solidarity, as someone who's not in occupied territories or not as a refugee and who, some, who has a citizenship, um, I'm an outsider to that conversation, but there is millions of Palestinians who've never experienced sovereignty, uh, uh, personal sovereignty, national sovereignty, and that's a part of, of the quest that has been a part of the Palestinian quest since, since 48. And because of that, I do think... Uh, since, 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 or, 1917. You know, <laughs> 1917, yes, actually, that's a, that's a much more accurate uh, year, but... <laughs> yeah, um, well, I don't know if that one we can take seriously. Um, or as a Palestinian, as Palestinian, as a Palestinian sovereignty question, but but the, the point is, I think that in our carefulness to kind of talk about the parameters of ne of the struggle and strategy now, we also have to be very careful about dismissing Palestinians' claim for for sovereignty and nationhood, um, because I, I I personally think that. It is for the Palestinians eventually, and we're talking about the 10 million Palestinians, right? Is that right? Can't include Palestinians because it's I don't remember. There's 10 million Palestinian 
Palestinians who are involved in a conversation like that, that I, I believe that the vast majority of them do want a form of national sovereignty that should not be disregarded. I do agree with you that this is not the question right now. Can I just add something to that? So I just want to add that just in, in, in the conversation of the, the struggle for sovereignty, it's also just a struggle for recognition and peoplehood. Mm -hmm. Because what it, this is the thing, this is the constant theme of the non-existence of Palestinians as a juridical people who are entitled to self-determination. Even if we're going to move past that model, it's almost like it's a juncture that never was never experienced. Mm -hmm. And so even if we think critically, if you want to think critically about um, the two-state solution and the fact that it's a red herring. It is. It has been. It was never on the table in the negotiation process. It's never, they're never negotiating for a Palestinian state. Mm -hmm. They're only negotiating for an autonomy framework and one that's almost verbatim with two small exceptions from the 1978 framework that it leads up to the 1979 Camp David Treaty between Egypt and Israel. And so when they return in 19... 93 to, to sign the Declaration of Principles, they're basically signing on to an autonomy agreement that never recognizes that Palestinians are a people. And in fact, um, if, if you even look at the arbitration clause, sorry, lawyers, um, but if you look at the arbitration clause of how Israel and the PLO are to settle disputes, it's distinct from the arbitration clause of Jordan and Egypt. And the reason for it is because of the lack of peoplehood. Israel doesn't recognize Palestinians as a people. The first Israeli leader who does recognize that there are people, and well, even though they recognize the PLO and, and, and Arafat does some maneuvering to sign as the PLO, but to recognize that the peoplehood is related, is, uh, related to a right to statehood is Abu Barak leading up to the 2000 Camp David um, agreements and their, uh, how they fall apart because of Israeli red lines, when it becomes the mythologi uh, mythological uh, most generous offer that's ever made for Palestinian statehood is made in 2000 and is made in, in a very comical way where what was offered was never a state even, but uh, under the semblance of a state. It was never really offered. <laughs> never recognizes the state. PLO, it's, it's the, the language is so carefully crafted. The, the Israel recognizes the PLO as the legitimate representative of the Palestinians. And even that, that was the concession. Yeah. Israel's concession was to recognize the juridical status of the PLO. That was what they gave. Yeah. And the PLO accepted it, or Arafat and the moderate forces and Abu Ala and Hassan al like accept this um, in exchange for the rest of their rights. The, the Labour Party continued to oppose a Palestinian state until 1996. And even when they, even after they're cynical. Yeah, they don't really embrace it. That's much for you. Man, much for your teacher in some politics. Yeah, it's cool. Uh, first, my compliment to all the presenters, including Ms. Arakat and the panel. I found all the presentations highly interesting and educational. Thank you very much. It has been very similar. Uh, I have a question for uh, Leah and Leah. Uh, as I listen to you, you talk about the sort of paradigm shift from assistance to citizenship and identity. I couldn't help but to think that it seems to me that that one can surmise from your argument that that maybe the one state solution is a better solution than two state. Because you are you're talking about a paradigm shift from assistance to uh, citizenship and emphasis on identity. Um, are, are, are these two synonymous, or, or they, you know, I'm no, I, I mean, as I listen to you, I feel like your argument is very much consistent with one state solution as opposed to two state solution. Although I definitely agree with you that to, on the notion of sovereignty and, and sovereignty belongs to people. And the question for Joel, uh, yes, of course, Sinai wasn't part of the biblical plan for the Palestinians uh, for the for the Jews. What about the Golan Heights? Was this What's the logic behind Golan Heights that Israelis are holding to that? It seems to me that it's more strategic than biblical. Uh, sure. I mean, for I, I think here there's for me there is a clear distinction.
distinction between two or three communities, which is the Palestinian citizens of Israel who are the focus of my research, and the Palestinians in the occupied territories, and, and, and Palestinian refugees who in certain ways are one community and in other ways are, are two different communities. But for Palestinian citizens of Israel, the resistance, if you're referencing the period between 67 and 93, the, the resistance was in the framework of Palestinian states within the occupied territories. It, for them, their place within the state, I think, was very much accepted as, as something that had not shift, as not going to shift, and I think that was pretty accepted among all Palestinians from, what is it, 78, when they moved beyond the DFLD one state solution idea. But from 78, I think there's very, very few Palestinians who are talking about historic Palestine as one entity. And, and thus, the Palestinian citizens of Israel are always for all sides of a different question, including for the Palestinian citizens themselves. So when they're asking, when the resistance is about statehood is a statehood for the, the other Palestinians, in, a, in an agreement that would also guarantee the rights for Palestinians within Israel. So the idea was basically that the PLO, as the legitimate representative of the Palestinian people, will negotiate an end to the Israeli occupation and a solution to the refugee problem in a framework that will also guarantee the rights of the Palestinians who remain within Israel and not undermine any of their rights. It is only after 93, with that agreement that basically pretty much disregarded most of the Palestinians, but definitely completely told Israel, those are all yours. We have nothing to do with them. That the Palestinians have to then go back to this paradigm of identity and citizenship as connected. Now that question, I think, in the way I understand it, is brought back to their court just like it was in the court between 48 and 67 when Palestinians had no official representation and they had to struggle for their own definition. The, so I think that the interim between 67 and 93 had, in that sense, not affected their definition because for now it was kind of, this is what it is, but we're also not focusing on that beyond the kind of immediate, def immediate defense of rights and existence, physical presence, because right now, this can be deferred to the PLO in a, in a more comprehensive resolution to the conflict. It is only when that is, becomes clearly not the case, and even more now, as it becomes even more questionable, and their citizenship becomes more under attack, that this question comes back. But I don't think it's ever in any of those points discussed in a sense of a one state for the Palestinian citizens of Israel. So whereas DFLP does talk about one state, the communists inside Israel don't ever at any point talk about one state since, let's say, December 47, um, I think. Just, just to add on, I want to just add on to what Linda said, because um, maybe what I said before about one state, two state isn't clear enough. Um, there is still the task of struggling against the Israeli occupation. Um, <coughs> struggling against the Israeli occupation, however, shouldn't be understood as some people in the United States would like us to understand it as the only problem. It's a very salient problem. And maybe through that, we will get to address the questions of sovereignty, right to self, national self-determination that both Nina and Nora raised. Go on Heights. Go on Heights is um, it's a chameleon um, because, uh, according to some biblical accounts, it is part of the land of Israel. But that's not why the settlers went there. The settlers who first went there were. Uh, young people who came from veteran kibbutzim and they thought there was nothing for us to do. Our kibbutzim were all built up. Let's go out to the wild west and be on the frontier and do new cool stuff. And these people were <coughs> not like the religio-nationalist settlers. They, they were uh, total secularists, but they were from the uh, the Achtot HaAvodah labor Zionist current, which basically wanted as much land as they could get, uh, and, and they did it for that reason. Why did the state of Israel authorize that? What? Golan Heights controls what the tributaries to the tributaries 
uh, to the other neuron, and this is critical in the long run. And not as security, absolutely, that, that's completely fictitious in the age of airplanes. Fictitious in the age of airplanes. And obviously, with the Syrians had the Golan Heights in 1967, it didn't help them one more way. That's a really good point. <laughs> okay, um, thank you for a very stimulating panel. And I traveled here from New Mexico just to meet with other people who care so much about what happened in 67. And I'm really glad that 1948 was picked up too. And I, I understand that ultimately we're talking about human rights issue and a colonial settler narrative that, that needs to be really looked at and the, the true concept of what that's really what the story is about. However, people are always bringing in religion, like you did, about the Jews and the promised land and, and all of that. So there's lots of identity issues here. There's the world of Palestine. And, you know, I've kind of spent a lot of time, I wrote that book right now, looking at the card about it, looking at the question of what is a Jew? And I still have not been able to come up with a really clear, satisfactory answer to that question. The only people who seem to really, really be able to clearly identify what is a Jew are the Nazis. And so, um, what is a Jew? And why, why, a, why, what is the meaning of a Jewish state? And Israel already is a very uh, multicultural place. And I have a friend who is an Israeli, Jewish, Muslim, Palestinian, American, because he was born there before 1948. And you mentioned something about uh, the Mizrahi Jews and the Sephardic Jews having a very strong Middle East identity. And so there's lots of identity issues and lots of words that need to be defined. And even when you look back at the Bible and you look at the um, divine deed that God uh, promised the land to the Jews and only they had the right to settle it. I can never understand why they don't uh, honor the fact that Abraham had more than one son. And so even by the divine deed and through that lineage, uh, still everybody seems to have the right to live there. And so I just would really like some of the words clarified um, in, in this conversation, and, and you started to do that, and I really appreciate that. The Supreme Court decision. <laughs> the, court the, court so <laughs> the court is not my instance for these type of things. <laughs> Everyone's looking at me. <laughs> no, I was looking at Nora. I, 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 I didn't need to say, but are you going to talk about who's an Israeli? <laughs> Because that's a, this is this is jurisprudence. Yeah. There isn't an Israeli in the Israeli Supreme Court. And there is a definition. There isn't a definition of a Jew in the Israeli Supreme Court. The, the Supreme Court. Is, the, the, there was a lawsuit that demanded that allowing people to put Israeli in the, under the section of identity. So the Israeli ID card actually says nationality, and the options are Arab, Jew, Druze, and there was one more, I think. Um, but anyway, so there was a group of Israeli liberal progressive professors and others who appealed to the Israeli Supreme Court demanding having adding one more identifier, which is Israeli. And the Israeli Supreme Court in 2006, 7 rejected this by saying, no, there has not been developed an Israeli identity that is distinct from a Jewish identity. So that's the first part. If we're going to go to legalese, so the Israeli Supreme Court has since 49, I think, or something, very early on, been dealing with this question of who is a Jew, according to Israeli law. And that has been deferred and deflected until, again, 2005, or something, where they decided that a reformed Jew can be a Jew. But um, they also have not been able to really give an answer to who, who a Jew is. So ju judiciary, judicially speaking, the questions are still hanging in you know, the highest form in Israel, which is still insists, the Supreme Court despite that, still insists that Israel can be a Jewish and a democratic state, um, but failing to define what Jewish is, um, I find that decision Just to challenge there's no real evidence. Yeah, and thus I'm no longer a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, in answering such a question, I, despite the fact that I'm not I, I don't turn to the court, <laughs> okay? Uh, I think that the best or the most useful way to define these things is whoever defines himself or herself as a Jew. 
is a Jew and whoever defines himself or herself as a Palestinian or as any other identity deserves us to recognize that identity. And, uh, but I think what we should understand is that identity politics is very limited in what it can achieve. Identity is very important for each and every one of us in you know, creating our point of view and the way we look at the world and how we were raised and what. But, but then we've got to go beyond that because it can't determine our politics okay, at, at, at the end. So this is, uh, I think this is important um, to know. By the way, Israeli ID cards, no, the new one, I have an old one, I haven't issued a new one, but the new ones don't have the Jewish, uh, whatever, the nationality thing on them. Um, these type of things have been used in the past for genocide. Okay, like, uh, no doubt by the Nazis, but also later in Rwanda, for instance, mm -hmm. Hutu and Tutsi, it was written on the IDs. So, but that's but not why it's, No, no, it's not, it's not why, but I'm happy it isn't, but it's still registered it's still, in, yeah. in the population yeah. registry, it's there, so. So I just want to add a couple of things. One, to build on this conversation about the law and actually, you know, this idea you know, that you brought up of, of wanting to prevent infiltrators from returning. So Israel is faced, and uh, you know, you're mentioning Shia again, Israel is faced with this conundrum of how do we both seal our borders but not afford the Palestinians who remained equality in, in, in citizenship because they're there. And so the compromise is this bifurcation of nationality and citizenship so that you can be an Israeli citizen, but you're not necessarily a Jewish national, and you create these tiers of a, a way of distributing state goods and privileges and rights and access of who is a, a Jewish national and an Israeli citizen and who is an Israeli citizen only. So this becomes a way very much for an innocuous kind of parading of, of racial discrimination and distinction. But in thinking about, we're still, I think, we're still very much, and uh, the Palestinian negotiating team is here, Abbas has said today, I want to, I can't even say it, it's so ridiculous. He, see, Abbas sees the, the potential for establishing a Palestinian state under Trump as very positive. As very, very positive. And so unfortunately, yeah, that's a whole other discussion about, you know, but unfortunately, the reason that I mention this is because, you know, we can talk about different horizons, but we're still very much in the paradigm of competing nationalisms. Mm -hmm. And this idea of, you know, we, and we can debate is Jewish nationalism, you know, and Jewish self-determination, does that have any basis in law? Da -da -da -da. But if, if you identify it as such and you're fighting for it as a political movement, it's asserted itself as much. We can think, however, at least for, you know, intellectually, you know, for ourselves, what are other ways to think about this outside of these competing nationalisms? And one way is to think about if we were to allow race. So there has been a recent synergy, and I've been working on this a lot, a recent synergy of black Palestinian solidarity. One of the things that that brings up, you can think about black nationalism and Palestinian nationalism. Very much I think that was appropriate in the 1960s and 70s especially. Um, but today, um, black liberation struggle, I think, has less to do with establishing a nationalist, you know, the national liberation, and much more to do with some sort, you know, how do you stop the condition of unfreedom? And so if we're using then a racial framework in order to interrogate, you know, the conditions, how does that then, how does that help us think differently? about the conflict. So it's not about competing nationalisms, and now it's about a race, a racial justice struggle. Mm -hmm. And if it's a racial justice struggle, it's insufficient to simply say Palestinians are black and Jews are white, right? That's insufficient, that doesn't work, because you have stratification amongst Palestinians and stratification amongst Jews. And in fact, in order to think about it, you have to think about how race, racial justice frameworks unsettle a settler needed binary, so that we now have to think about Afro-Israelis and Afro-Palestinians, and also think about um, different stratifications and approximations to whiteness that get recreated in each of these societies. I share this because I think about it. I don't think it's necessarily happening on the ground, um, but I think there's potential for it. I saw someone recently um, of, who was one of the founders of the Israeli Black Panther Party. 
And so he's still very much, you know, he's Mizrahim and very much still committed to this idea. And in fact, Ayman Ode, who leads the joint list, um, has actually tried to reach out to Mizrahim in order to build these alliances, but we're still, they're, they're impeded because we're still very much stuck. Struck, but it's very, yeah. We're still very much stuck in, the, in a competing nationalist framework. Please go ahead. Um, I think the racial justice uh, uh, conversation is much more challenging um, from a Zionist viewpoint, and I, I was thinking about uh, merging that idea with the one state, two state conversation, which is, to me, just a uh, decades long diversion. And um, because the, uh, what I hear a lot is the advocation for one state is met with this, um, you're, you're a hater, you want to destroy Jewish people, you want to destroy the state, and it's really, they, uh, they want to own that argument. And it's like a big, a big diversion. Whereas the social justice issue, it's like, why don't you guys fight about what state or what form it's going to be in? Because this movement is moving towards a right-based right issue, which is something everyone can relate to. And the argument we've been on about these competition on the states is just, you know, it's, it should be buried. It should be a dead. It should be dead. If I may, I, mean, I, I think there is a, a problematic with the identity politics <coughs> and identitarian based struggles that is solely based on national context, context. But I do think that historical justice still needs to play with that. And, and that's why, for me, plugging in with a conversation of, of Black Lives Matter and, and Black Justice is also accompanied with plugging in with also a Native American perspective, where Israel's new horizon now is Native American washing. Uh, all of a sudden, apparently, the parallel is Israel and the Native Americans. And as a Palestinian, I'm still baffled by that. I don't know this out there. But, but for me, a part of the, the, the conversation has to be historical justice, not only current um, undoing of injustices. Um, and, and because of that, this conversation is a part of tying it to 67 and 48 and, you know, 1915, 17, or whatever <coughs> we settled on. But I do think that the conversation has to continue to also recognize historical rights in Palestine, claims to land in Palestine, and undoing of those. Because the conversation for that work and the importance of 48 for me is that the that, that justice to include the refugees has to include that conversation because otherwise they are in the limbo. And literally right now Palestinian refugees, think about Palestinian refugees in Syria, they're literally in the limbo, in the limbo out there. And unless we are alive at all. If they're alive, exactly. Like the ones who are still alive and surviving this onslaught are actually as horrible as the situation of Syrians is in this current conflict, the Palestinian refugees are the ones who are kind of, you know, how far can you really go in this situation, in this series of injustice? But unless we address this issue within that framework, we're taking them out of the conversation. We're taking the refugees in Lebanon, we're not in a vacation either out of this conversation. But I think the conversation does have to bring all these aspects together with, with a keen eye on, on the historical question. If I could add, um, I, I, I agree with the thrust of what Lena is trying to say. Uh, I'm, I'm a little bit older than the others on the panel here. So I remember when simply asserting that there is a Palestinian people that has national rights would create hysteria. I mean, it just people would go berserk. Uh, and now, that's kind of, in many quarters at least, <laughs> accepted uh, what their national rights might be. That's different, that could be a debate. But th th there are Palestinian people. It's, I mean, I grew up being told that the notion that there is a Palestinian people is an anti-Semitic plot. Uh, so we are now, I think, in a comparable situation in which most of the formulas that have been used as frameworks for resolving the question are no longer viable. Uh, it's pretty clear that 
what Oslo imagined for the scene just down the toilet, uh, whether or not some other version of two states might, might be feasible at all. So we need to try out um, uh, whatever works. So Nora mentioned, well, OK, what if we think about it in racial terms? And Israel is a highly racialized society. Uh, so there's plenty to talk about in those terms. But not all Mizrahi identify in a way that would allow them to think of themselves as somehow having anything in common with Palestinians. Most of them. So, 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 yeah, let's try. I mean, there are Mizrahim, on the other hand. Uh, uh, there are several new political formations who are trying to do it and, and who are properly quite critical of the historic uh, Ashkenazi-led peace movement for having ignored the Mizrahim and their social issues and so on for decades and decades and decades. So th there's room for movement and so on. I, I don't think we are in a position to say th this is how we, we can go forward. Yeah. I think we should try anything that appears reasonable and, and see where it gets us. Yes, please. Thank you guys for um, today. Um, I have actually two questions. So um, my first question is, uh, there's a big argument I hear about um, the hate on both sides, uh, going away from politics and all that. On one side, you have uh, uh, some people who are using a form of incitement to target uh, Jewish civilians, and on the other side, the same thing is happening. And it's just this constant battle on the ground of, of not the government, but the people, and some argue that that's the major obstacle to peace. Um, do you think that uh, from the Palestinian side, it's, uh, this um, resistance is uh, justified in the same way that uh, Israel was formed in the same kind of resistance? Um, that's one question. And then uh, my second question is, so for example, I'm uh, an Orthodox Jew, uh, my family is from the Middle East, so when, I, when my family went to Israel, uh, they did not see themselves as uh, colonialists. Um, but now the big um, kind of narrative is that uh, Israel and, and specifically Zion is known as like a racist, uh, colonialist state. So I'm just curious uh, what your guys' thoughts on that. Um, answer the colonial question. Yeah. Yeah. all the time. Yeah. Um, I agree with you, maybe not every Jew who went to Palestine from 1882 onward saw themselves as a colonialist, but the movement itself did frame itself very much as so as such. It is a movement that was the Zionist movement because Jews have been going to Palestine historically since basically Andalusia. That's what Sephardim are, right? That's a part of the whole story. But the specifically the project that creates Israel is a project that starts from a movement that basically finds itself both within a European nationalist context and a European colonialist context, and very much frames itself as such. So if you read Herzl from you know, the Jewish state to various declarations throughout the time, he's very clearly saying we are at a time of colonialism. And just like you are doing, and this is the speech that he speak, gives the Germans that is just brilliant, I use it with my students, because it's exactly that. He says, just like Germany is now embarking on a settler colonial project, we need to, we have a right to do that. So the fact that not everyone who went there was a part of, or was conceiving themselves as going as settlers, does it mean that that was not actually a, a part of a, a, the project that they were taking part of? Exactly, just like you know, Americans who went to the West were not thinking about themselves as you know being settlers necessarily. They were going to redeem the land of some for some conception or another, or find gold or something. But that doesn't change the fact of what it is. So I think it is very important to understand historical events in the context in which they are, in which they take shape of. And the other thing that I also usually try to highlight to my students is that the fact that we now understand colonialism to be negative 
should not shape how we understand historical events. But because when Herzl was saying we're colonialists, he was very, very proud of saying that. And so did you know the slew of other Zionist intellectuals until the decolonization moment in the 1940s and 50s and 60s when when, when how we understand as a moral value what colonialism is shifts. And it is only after that that this becomes a negative thing. So our understanding of it in a historical moment that happens needs to be shaped by the moral perception at the time. Sorry. Anyone else? Yes. But a little bit of a pet peeve. I would like to add. Okay. No, I just want to add two very small points. It's obvious that not everyone that participates in the defines himself or herself as colonialist, and every colonial project has its other justification. So you see European colonialism with the white man's burden, so Israeli colonialism has another set of justifications, return to the moment, etc. Et now, but, but I do think that Zionism is a version of colonialism, so it's not 100% exactly like European colonialism. Of course, every Every historical instance is a bit different from, from others, and there is the component with the establishment of Israel of self-determination to the Jewish people. Okay, so some, as you mentioned that uh, the question of is there a Palestinian people or not was very controversial. In some Palestinian and other circles, there was a very big question, is there a Jewish people? So, and, and some are still asking this question, which I think is just not important since there are enough people who define themselves as such and are willing to politically fight for that. But, uh, so, so it is a version of, a local version or a specific version of colonialism, but it doesn't mean that it's not that. It is Can I say something? Okay, so I just wanted to add to this as well by, to really click on your question about hate and between people, I, I'm not going to really, you can address that, Joel, is that what you're going to do? Yeah. Okay, you do it. No, no, you do it. Uh, I was just going to make a comment of, I think that, you know, as someone, um, I, I do see things in terms of structure. And so, because of that, I think that we need to be focused on the structure and allow what I would think are symptomatic of those structures to be part of, of resolution, rather than uh, as the alternative to resolving the structural issues. I'll let Joel discuss that. I want to talk about other colonialism also. Um, and this comes up in the literature on settler colonialism of who is a settler. And so the debate is, is the settler, for example, Mrs. Uh, Patrick Wolf, for example, will, will insist that, you know, the settler doesn't have to have any intent to settle. They can even be forcible migrants. And of course, that's controversial because then you, then you would have to then equate that to, you know, descendants of African slaves who are forcibly brought to the United States are then part of that category because there's no intent. Or do you only have to have the intent to migrate without the intent to settle? And that's another way of seeing it. Or there's a third category in settler colonial studies to think, no, you have to have the intent to settle in order to be a settler. And I think that's what your question is getting to. This idea of what about those who sought refuge, where there was no intent to settle, there is no intent to necessarily displace. And I think Lena answered that right on the head, that one, this is getting us into this debate of who is the settler. But two, because it's operating with a settler colonial framework, does it matter? Because even if the intent is not there, once the population is there, how are they relating to the native population that already exists? Are they integrating into that population, into that community as a way of somehow integrating into their culture and their sovereignty? Is there an indigenous sovereignty that they're subjecting themselves to? Or instead, are they trying to remove that native person and take their place um, as the indigenous subject, which I think very much is what um, Israel has done and Israel's population has done, whether or not there was an original intent to settle. The fact that that remains the continuous political project to remove in order to replace, I think, settles the score of this is very much a settler colonial issue um, and um, that should inform the way that we're thinking about solutions. And just, I just want to say, I really did appreciate this idea, Lena, of you thinking, helped me think through, because I've been stuck on this, of thinking of the relationship between anti-blackness and settler colonialism, that it doesn't have to be either or, that in combating anti-blackness, there can also be a, a focus, like as you said, this keen focus on the historical injustice, which is not necessarily the restoration of indigenous sovereignty, but at least the acknowledgement of its removal. So I'm just going to 
follow up what Nora said about structure. It's, it's great to be on a panel with people who can read your mind. <laughs> um, <laughs> people aren't born hating each other. They need to learn who to hate and how to hate and what acceptable ways of expressing hate are. And that's all structure. Th those things happen through an educational system, uh, through uh, bifurcated uh, labor markets where some people are going to receive preference for certain positions and other people not. And it's not, everybody wants to understand their personal experience or the experience of their people like their families and others that they are close to as somehow um, being the bedrock of hardcore reality. It's not uncomplicatedly the case. My parents first went to Palestine, it was Palestine then, um, as Zionists, but they were on the far left of the Zionist movement, and they were binationalists. They did not believe in establishing a separate Jewish state. Um, they wanted to live with Palestinian Arabs, not quite in the way that Nora said, but something like that. Um, by the time they passed away, um, they were racists. They learned to become racists because of the social structures of the State of Israel, because my mother was president of a Hadassah club in which the vast majority of the other women came from South Africa and brought their South African style racism mm -hmm. with them and that just became the way people talked and the first two times she was shocked but eventually she got used to it and all sorts of things like that that shape and reshape people's consciousness. So I'm talking about my parents here, They're, these are people who I love, they both passed away. Um, but because there was 10,000 miles distance between us, I could also see how they were changing over the period of several decades. Um, and because I'm a historian and I do that sort of thing. Um, just a caution not to think of the experiences that are close to you as the ones that really explain what's going on. Yes, please. Um, I was just wondering if you guys could address, there's a narrative on campuses um, of Israel, of the lack of Israel's right to exist that comes up. So I'm just curious um, what your thoughts are on that narrative and how that may benefit or harm either side. Um, I'll briefly say um, there's two questions that I think are being are often conflated with each other, which is the question of historical injustice and historical, you know, born of historical sin. I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with that uh, term, and the question of, of right to exist right now. And then actually, no, the third question is the right to exist as a Jewish state. So I'll say it right out, right off the bat, as a Palestinian citizen of Israel who's living in my ancestral homeland. No, Israel has no right. To exist as a Jewish state, just like America does not have a right to, live, to exist as a white state or a Protestant state, which was established as, right, or any other form. Any state that basically is premised on an exclusion, for me, already takes it out. South Africa did not have a right to exist as a, as a white state. Uh, Zimbabwe did not have a right to exist as a road state or right within it, limited to even more than white state. Uh, but, um, that's a hard. That for me, that that question is easy to answer. I think the question, the argument that Palestinian Palestine, the the mainstream of Palestine activism, <coughs> not you know, put everyone in, 
is, is challenging the historical justice involved in the creation of Israel. So if I say Israel was not legitimate to be established at the expense of the Palestinians, I don't think in that I'm making an argument that says Israel right now does, right now does not have the right to exist. I think we all recognize, or most of us uh, who have reasonable analysis of the situation, recognize Israel exists and it's not going anywhere. What we are challenging is Israel's right to exist as an exclusionary state, as an occupying state. But as a, as a physical presence, as a state that had that Jews have a right to live in, as equal citizens to a range of other people in a way that deconstructs the injustices and acknowledges historical injustice, I think very, very few people would be arguing about that. So can I just follow up? Um, I'm just I guess the concern a little bit is that I don't think most on people on either side would be able to make that distinction. So when there are certain phrases that are being used, it can be taken, there wouldn't, I don't know how to, I, I can't even <laughs> explain it. Yeah, so like that makes sense what you're saying, like I, I understand mm -hmm. what you're saying, but I don't know if a student on campus who is saying those things would be able to necessarily make that distinction because there, there isn't that knowledge. And I, I think you could say that um, the pro-Israel activists, some of they might not be able to comment on those things. Probably won't, wouldn't be able to comment on those things because they don't have the, the deep knowledge. So I don't know how much what happens on U.S. campuses or anywhere else affects what's going on there. But I don't know that there's a knowledge base on either side to be able to have those conversations constructively, right? So I, I guess it's just it's. It's very confusing. Can, can, I, I, just, uh, can I jump in really quick just to touch on your live room thing? I guarantee you tomorrow, or maybe Monday, in the Daily Cal, it will, the headline will be, CMES says Israel doesn't have a right to exist. <laughs> guarantee. Just no, to I'm I'm saying, saying, uh, <laughs> I mean, that, that's just the way that that Well, the other right. thing I wanted to say, two things I wanted to say. I'm not sure what the, so I just, I, I this is my alma mater. Mm -hmm. This was the place of, of I think my most formative education as a student activist. Mm -hmm. That distinction, to be able to make that distinction was made in the course of being involved with other students, of being engaged with anti-Zionist Jews who were working with us. So I'm, I'm a little confused of how the conversation, rather than um, becoming, I think, more nuanced and, and complex, has regressed to a point where we can't make those distinctions. I think it's really, and especially, especially the fact that right now, I would say in the United States, the most significant uh, critic of Israel in terms of a grassroots form is Jewish Voices for Peace. They, by large, have the largest base. They were the only organization that actually honored Rasmi Yaudeh, who has otherwise been tarnished as a con and said, dragged through the mud and said to be a convicted terrorist, despite her conviction being the result of sexual torture. They are the ones that are on the cutting edge, which in and of itself creates complexity in this idea between the deliberate collapse between Judaism as a religion and Zionism as a nationalist project. And so I'm, I'm a little confused about then what's happening on campus that fails to see that nuance. I think that, you know, on, on elite levels, that collapse is deliberate. So when we see Sheldon Edelson fully support the Trump administration, which people say is alt-right, but is a, a way of saying basically neo-Nazi, right? That they have actually exhibited and said and participated in anti-Semitic activities, that Sheldon Edelson is then willing to support the Trump administration because of their willingness to protect Israel at all costs, is where that collapse happens. Because we're not, then we, we're not seeing what is in fact the movement against, uh, to end Jewish bigotry, and what is in fact just trying to preserve the nationalist project. I don't, I don't, I'm, I mean, this, I'm thinking out loud because I don't see where the confusion is or how that can happen. And I feel, as personally, I feel like, you know, campus is where some of these conversations happen, but it's now either they're not happening at all or it's with anger and, and maybe not having that knowledge, and so there aren't the conversations being happening. In this level, again, I don't know how important those conversations are, but whatever. So I, I was just curious about your thoughts on all of this. It, it's, it, I think it's important to sort out the categories, though, and when you're engaged in the heat of the moment of political activism, 
You might not. So if the question were posed, is Jewish supremacy in Israel-Palestine legitimate? Probably not so many people would say yes. There are people who would say yes, but not so many would say yes. They're a little bit more optimistic. <laughs> the category of states having a right to exist is not exactly legally so sound. There are no rights. States, states are legitimate by virtue of the, their citizens. Well, 20% of Israel's citizens, that's not even talk about the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, are Palestinian Arabs. And they are not equal citizens. So that's what raises a question about the legitimacy of the state of Israel. That, that it systematically excludes or minoritizes a very substantial and growing proportion of its citizens. There is a, an intentional campaign to make people believe that the state of Israel represents the Jewish people. It doesn't. It never has. There have always been Jewish opponents to Zionism and to the state of Israel. They were either communists or Bundists, most of whom were uh, killed during the Nazi mass murder of European Jewry, or ultra-Orthodox Jews, or just all manner of non-Zionist Jews. Uh, so it's effacing the multiplicity of Jewish identity and Jewish attitudes towards the state of Israel and the Zionist movement throughout the 20th and now 21st centuries uh, that is quite intentionally contributing to this heat and confusion among political activists. Can I just add, though, that international law actually does, and so just to bring it full circle, I think you're absolutely right on the legitimacy of the state based on its treatment which then triggers this idea of the responsibility to protect and the, this juxtaposition of your legitimacy as a state, your sovereignty is derived from the, the responsibilities that you have to your population. But international human rights law, certainly, as well as the UN Charter, very much inscribes and reifies a state's right to territorial integrity and a state's right, therefore, to, uh, to be protected from conquest. And so existence is enshrined, which is what um, drives the debate throughout the 1970s and why the PLO is never victorious in combating Israel in the way that uh, um, the ANC combats South Africa. But not to take away from what you're saying, but that there is <coughs> legal discourse about that right, and that's the contradiction in the law itself, which then makes most lawyers into scholars because you're more interested in studying those contradictions than of participating in the legal fictions. We have time for one last question, Sue Hair. Hi. Um, so the heel from being here, I wanted to comment also on what you were talking about from being a student that's really, I'm, so I'm a student on the campus and I'm really involved in the conversation with Israel Palestine. Um, I'm, I'm involved in like, numerous organizations and have been to a lot of the protests and have seen the counter protests and the different conversations after the protests and all these other things. And I don't think it's fair to peg the campus and the students who are in those groups as non um, critical of the conversations and the nuances of the conflict, because I think that they are. And I think that there is, especially with conflation of anti Zionism and anti Semitism, like that's been a big part of Jewish Ways for Peace on our campus, but also. SJP talks about it, different groups on our campuses talk about it. Hillel, there's a lot of um, people in, that I know who are in Hillel also talk about that and trying to, um, and you know, there's issues when they bring it up in certain areas, but regardless, that, that conversation exists, and I think it's unfair to try to say that they just get mad and start yelling at each other and there's nothing that gets done. I do think it could be more productive, and I think that's what you were getting at, but I don't think that it's, like, yeah, I just don't think it's fair to say that. Um, my question, though, was first, I think it's amazing that there, um, how many women are on this panel. I think that's really representative of um, one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. No, I, I do. I think in academia it's There's going to be another one. There's going to be another one. I'm saying, it's, it's honestly, like, I mean, that's, like, like, that's huge in academia itself. Like, it's a very gendered field. But um, we were talking about intersectional frameworks in terms of liberation. Also, sorry, I lost my voice at a concert, so it's kind of shaky. Um, <laughs> um, 
But that intersectional framework, I think, is really interesting that you brought that up in terms of liberation. And I was wondering where the place for um, feminism is in that framework. Mm -hmm. And Linda Sarsour sort of recently like stated, and it was used everywhere, and I thought it was amazing that you can't have them, like there is no room for um, Zionism in the feminist movement in the United States. And is that true? Um, and how do you use that kind of framework and that perception and liberation in that kind of conversation? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Are you looking at me, Jill? <laughs> I'll answer really quick. This is actually something I've been talking about, and, and something that I wrote in response to. So Linda is saying that in response to um, the platform. So now in the Women's March platform, it's, been, it's an increasingly, increasingly radical platform, and so it's not based solely on womanhood, which represents the first wave of feminism, of thinking about the feminist movement as being a movement for women's equality, and basically equality relative to men, so you center this kind of, the you know, womanhood at the expense. <laughs> Somehow, is a single issue. This comes from Audre Lorde, not from Linda Sarsour, right? But that, that womanhood is not a single issue. Uh, we don't lead single issue lives. So that if you're a Native American woman, for example, living on a reservation and dealing with domestic violence, your response to that condition is not going to be necessarily to call the police to violate the, you know, the tenuous sovereignty that you enjoy. Or you're a black woman dealing with that, or you're an Arab woman. In each of those situations, your considerations are different. And this is what led to, in 1974, the Kambahi River Statement that black radical women um, wrote and pushed, which was the idea of intersectional feminism, that we are living these very, um, very intricate lives where gender, class, and sex, uh, excuse me, gender, class, and uh, what are my misses? Hello. Racism, <laughs> obviously are all intersecting, and so one of the things they write in their opening lines is that thinking about the rape of black women by white masters is, is, uh, it is all of those things happening at once. It's the economic <coughs> exploitation of being able to create more property, it's the sexual assault, and it's the racial dimensions. And so these are the types of frameworks that are animating what is feminism and what's creating a fracture in the Women's March platform right now, specifically because the Women's March was to be led by, as a response to, you know, vindicating Hillary Clinton's loss, and it was the protest to that that actually um, moved the organizers to invite three women of color, including Linda, to lead the march, and in their leadership have created this broader platform of intersectional feminism. And Elizabeth Shire then writes in the New York Times, I want to be a Zionist and a feminist, and you're not leaving room for me. But at the same time, is also saying, you can be a feminist and not believe in a $15 minimum wage. You can be a feminist and not believe in the right of the Standing Rock Sweet Nation um, to oppose the pipeline, the Dakota Access Pipeline. So she's not just saying everybody emphasized what she was saying about Zionism and feminism, but dismissed that she was pushing a very dangerous framework, a a political framework of what feminism is that threatens to unravel not only where Palestine is as part of this movement, but where all these other issues, of, of very progressive issues, also fit in, in this framework. And so I'm very much part of the camp that thinks that we, we lead intersectional lives and, we, and I subscribe to intersectional feminism as a way. And I do think that when, when these women who suffer the greatest marginalization are ostensibly at the bottom of the well, that when they fight for their liberation to get out, they're taking everybody else with them. And that's the difference between a womanhood for feminism and an intersectional feminism. Yeah. And I think there's, just to pick on the last point, which is there is basically that the argument is a regression to like a white class of feminism, which basically said, well, it's about womanhood only. Mm -hmm. So a, a proper feminist had to be what was expected of a feminist mm -hmm. struggle that could focus on a white American middle class privileged situation where you know you can go I, sometimes I say just, you can fight to burn your bra when you can when when you're at that phase but you can actually 
when you have to deal with all the other 20 things that are actually holding you back as a woman, well, then that's just a privilege. Um, and I think we do have to be very careful of, of that discourse because that's an exclusionary discourse that was a part of the 1970s mm -hmm. feminism, unfortunately, in the US that excluded kind of the feminism of the third world, and if that term is still allowed, but, but that's something that we need to be very careful from, from what I think is a regression. Okay, so uh, thank you all for coming. We'll be back here at 3.30 to hear Donna Anacott's uh, keynote speech. Until then, thank you so much. Wonderful questions.